Hey, hey, every pone, it's Digibrony here once again with a Digi's crib video. I know it's been months since I did part five or six or whatever it was of this series, but now I'm finally back by popular demand. Now, I need to stress this because when I was making these videos, I knew that people would watch them. I knew that I was at a point where people were, there was going to be someone who would watch anything I was going to put on the Digibrony or Digibrony After Dark channel. I knew it would be a very small audience, but it's a project I've always wanted to do. I've actually done videos in the past of filming my room, so it's something that's just always with me for some reason. But I didn't expect that people would get so into it. I mean, I didn't expect the videos to be so long, first of all, and then when they were so long, for people to actually watch all of them and then keep asking me, when are you going to do another Digi's Room video? And I'm like, Wow, you guys are really into those, huh? So, and then of course, my girlfriend has been bugging me about making a new one because she loves the series. She rewatches the episodes and everything, and I was like, okay, I definitely need to make another one of these now if someone's that into them. So, you guys asked for it, you got it. Another Digi's Room video. And this is where the collection is going to start to get really interesting. Now, just for cohesion's sake, because we have moved on to wall number two, two, finally, um, the manga collection's right there from the last video, uh, just to my left, but we're on the, the other wall next to it. And this is where the collection's going to start getting weird. See, up until this point, I've showed you a lot of stuff that I own that's cool stuff. It's like, oh, cool, you own that. That's interesting. But anybody could have that. We're about to get into some of the stuff that's just like, you'd only find this in my room, in this weird, this this sort of cabinet space that I'm sitting in front of is basically where I just threw all the shit I had no real place for. It's not DVDs or CDs or anything that's easily categorized. A lot of it's really old stuff that I used to collect when I was a kid, or just obscure random shit that was laying around. We're going to start though with these amps, because they're in here. This amp, I believe, is Victor's guitar amp that he bought a couple years ago. And it's really good. It's a great amp. Then we have this shitty bass amp that came with a... See, this, this bass and guitar amp came with starter packs, where basically you'd buy a bass. Not this one. This one belongs to my friend Marcus uh, that he left at my house for eternity. But you'd buy a bass like this. It would come with like an amp and a DVD like explaining how to play bass or whatever that nobody would ever watch. Um, some like guidebooks and stuff. Just basically you'd, you'd get like a starter pack for an instrument for about $300, which is a pretty great price. The instruments themselves, you know, were kind of shit. This one is nicer than, uh, than, than the ones that you would have gotten in those. But again, this is not mine. It's Marcus's. Um, but they came with amps. So we have a couple of these. They're kind of shit. The bass amp's all right, but the guitar amp is absolute crap. And the reason they're in my room, even though I don't play any instruments, is that my band, who you may or may not know that I have a band that I lead called Trial of the Golden Witch, which I guess I'll put a link in the description or something since I'm talking about it. But most of what we play is improv music, where we'll just get a bunch of dudes in a room who have instruments, and they just make shit up. And I usually sing over it in obnoxious voices and whatever. But uh, when we play that stuff, we play it in here because I have all the recording equipment. So everyone just kind of leaves their shit in here because it's like, oh, we don't usually play instruments unless we randomly feel like it and then we record it. So we might as well leave all the shit in the room with the guy with the recording device. And it seems like any time I move this stuff out of my room, it always ends up being right before we end up actually using it, and then it all ends up back, so it's not worth the effort. Got a cable to connect a to connect to an amp. This looks like an amp to wall cord, so yeah, all amp equipment. I have no fucking idea what this is. Some kind of tape roller. I don't know how that got there. We're gonna start over here with this white shelf that is it's not visible like it's not just for the camera 
you can't see this shelf. It's just too close in proximity to everything else. This shelf is for stuff that really has no place anywhere else. Kind of like this one, but this one's for toys that have no place. Most of these are toys that I bought when I was like 12 or that my mom got for me when she was working at Spencer's years ago. And uh, the microphone is behind me. Let's move it over here. I guess I'll stand it up. <laughs> totally not going to edit this. All right. So anyway, these shelves over here, weird stuff. Um, although there's actually a, a bamboo sword over here, a training sword. This is one of those things that I really, really wanted one of these when I was like 13. But it was like, these are like $30. And as a kid, I wanted one, but it was always like, you could buy this, or you could buy an anime DVD. This is in the time where it was like, every once in a while I happened to have money. So I never got one. My parents didn't really want me to have any uh, weapons or anything because I have two little brothers and they were kind of young and they were like, they're going to fight with those. You can't stop them. But, um, so I got this later in life when it wasn't as cool and I wasn't going to play with it as much, but oh well. This, I don't remember if I showed this in another video, but I don't think I did. This is a garden hose attachment. As you can see, it has an attachment on the end. You're probably wondering why the hell is this in my room? Well, this is also Purple Steve. Now the explanation for that one is, um, I believe early 2010 or early 2011, one of those, I was writing a story. It was This is like the last fiction, the last major fiction project I worked on with Cyrano and Purple Steve, which is a story that me and my little brother Shade had come up with. Um, Shade actually came, I came to Shade and I said, I want to write a fantasy adventure story basically give me a plot and he looks over and he sees this in his room and he I guess he'd been using it as like a sword because it kind of looks like a sword and he was like all right a guy is out mowing his lawn and he sees a, 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 a hose attachment and it gets struck by lightning and it turns purple and it can talk and he uses it to fight demons that's the storyline so I wrote that story, at least the first 10 chapters of it before I gave up, and this is what Purple Steve would be. I've always wanted to actually like paint it purple so it could be Purple Steve, but uh, that's why I'm holding on to it. Moving along, oh lord. Alright, here's the shitty bass I was talking about, and the shitty guitar. The shitty guitar is in the case, it doesn't even have any strings on it, it's pretty badly damaged, so... I guess it's just around really for sentimental value, or if somebody wants it, I can give it away or something. Here's a shitty bass. It's just like basic, you know, baby's first instrument kind of thing. Another guitar. This one is funny because it's my aunt had got this for her daughter and has a kill switch and gauge sticker on it. And it's like, I don't want to take it off because I feel like it adds character to the base, but kill switch engage sucks. Apologies to any kill switch engage fans. Uh let's see what's over here on this action figure shelf. So we have Murdoch, I think that's his name, from the Gorillas. Um this guy cannot stand. There is it, it just these Gorillas toys are really badly made. As you can see his head just fell off as I was saying that. They were just made in such a way that they cannot really stand. They can't really hold their instruments. Their props don't really stay on. Their heads don't stay on. He can't stand. He's supposed to have a base. It's probably sitting around up there somewhere. But the guy falls over so much. That's why he's not on a normal shelf. Because he, he sucks as a toy. This is just a guitar clip. It's a thing you put on, uh, put on the strings so that it changes the whatever. I don't fucking know. Oh, uh, this is recent. My dad was at like a a hard rock cafe and he got these like little mini guitars. I don't know why. He was it was like he was on a trip. He wanted to bring home souvenirs. He got that and I was like, I don't really need it, but whatever. Here we have one of the cooler toys. And the reason these toys are all like knocked down and super dusty and all that shit is because like at some point um a, I'm going to say 6 months ago, some cable guy came in here. And I guess the cable to the rest of the house runs right behind this collection. So he just, like, 
took this thing out because I wasn't there. So he just like took it out and just like left all my toys in fucking shambles on the shelf. And I don't know. I was too lazy to pick them up, I guess. But um, this is the most rambling video of all time. Holy shit. All right. So we have Sean. It's Sean from Shaun of the Dead. And that's a pretty cool movie, and this is a pretty cool toy. I mean, he doesn't move or anything, but he's really well made. It's one of those uh, Todd McFarlane toy line, I think. Um, he's got the cricket bat. Uh, there's supposed to be some seed, like some records you can put in this vinyl collection and, you know, like pretend he's throwing them at the zombies or whatever, but he's not really... I guess he can move his arms, but that's about it. So, yeah, that's cool. Oh, we have uh, a really small and horribly... Oh my god, this thing is caked in dust. How did it get so bad over there? It's kind of gross. Um, really small Alexander a Anderson from Helsing. He's missing half of one of his swords because we moved like 16 times since I was a kid. So, <laughs> interesting. Here we go. Um, here is a Red Eyes Black Dragon Yu-Gi-Oh card. And the reason it's in this special case is that this was um, a limited edition Red Eyes Black Dragon from some starter deck, I think. But basically, at some point, like s seven years ago, I was online looking at Yu-Gi-Oh card prices, and this card, for whatever reason, was worth like $72 at the time, which to me is a fuckload of money. So, I, especially then, so, like, I took it, I put it in a special case, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm gonna sell this shit on eBay or something, but I never did, so I have no idea what it's worth now, probably less, uh, there's Murdoch's fucking base, doesn't even have any strings on it, those toys, the Gorilla's toys are really, like, lazily made, some random ass tech deck viking, I don't know why, um, come here, come here, you son of a, ah, now we have Russell, also from Gorillas. This one is especially bad, because he's supposed to have a wrench, but the, the hole for the wrench to stick into his hand is really shallow, and he's also supposed to carry a drum, but the drum doesn't really fit into his hand and arm space. Like, it just kind of dangles there. It looks really bad. These are the worst toys. Like, it's cool to own them, because it's like, uh, here's the drum, in fact. Like, it's not really... There's no, like it doesn't like click in place or something it, uh, it's dumb uh, this is for 2D he has a microphone Ugh. we have a bigger Alexander Anderson from Helsing this one should have some knives and stuff uh, these were the, the Alexander Anderson ones I got in like 2003 when they were super on sale at Suncoast this is way back when Suncoast had all the anime in the world and all the anime toys and I got him. He can't move his legs, which are completely straight, but he can move his big-ass arms. So, yeah, it's a dumb toy, but whatever. Um, then we have this motherfucker. Oh my god, half his glasses broke off. When the fuck did that happen? We have Kevin from Sin City, the creepy-ass motherfucker cannibal who was played by Elijah Wood. Um, ordinarily, he'd have these glasses, but it looks like they got broken half, probably when that motherfucker was fucking with my toys. But he also has really hard time standing up. The only way to make him stand up is to turn his torso completely sideways, and then he's capable of standing because his balance is correct. But it looks stupid, so dumb toy. This whole shelf is like a litany of regret, basically. Um, here we have what would be, if it hadn't broken, again, thanks to that asshole, uh, a Joker bobblehead. The head never actually bobbled though, because the spring's not long enough for this big ass head of his. But the neck broke off of the body, so now it's just a headless Joker or something. I love The Dark Knight. That's one of my favorite movies of all time. I love the Joker in that movie. I mean, everyone does, but I'm just saying I do too. <laughs> uh, 2D from Gorillas. I don't have a noodle, sadly. My mom could never find noodle in the store. And then we have a figure of Quentin Tarantino's character in Planet Terror. 
I have never actually seen Planet Terror, but I am a big fan of Quentin Tarantino, so I guess it's kind of cool to have an action figure of him. I think this is another Todd McFarlane one. Again, it's super dirty and gross because it's been on this particular shelf, and that's it for that shelf. So that is quite literally the Island of Misfit Toys, and I'm just going to throw them all back on because that's how they were. They were just thrown on. Sean can stay. Sean is actually supposed to be over here because he's actually a cool toy. Uh, uh. Alright, so moving along, now that we're done with the, the ridiculous shelf. We're going to head over to this thing. So what is this thing, you might be asking? Because most of the shelves in my collection look like they were made to hold the things that they're holding because those are all newer shelves. But uh, this one's supposed to be a TV stand. Originally, it would have had a, like two glass panes on the front, and they would have like opened up. And you would have put like VCRs and shit in there and then had a TV on top of it. I have no idea how old this is, probably easily more than a decade, um, probably like 15 years old. Again, my family moved constantly, so a lot of shit just like either broke or got damaged. I'm sure the glass cases on this just had to be pulled off at some point while we were moving, and that's why they're not there. This thing's a fucking mess, especially on the top. Um, there was a time when it was kind of organized, but it's just like, whatever. So, first of all, we have... Some recent additions, that new uh, BronyCon guidebook, a My Little Pony Jumbo coloring book. The reason this is up here instead of in my drawer is because of that um, 50K video special, uh, which is also why the crayon bucket is up here, because I was decorating stuff for the 50K video. This, interestingly enough, little Applejack that, um, that came with one of those packs of cards you fold it up, like it starts off as a card shape and you fold it into into a stand. What's interesting about this is that it was in the 50k video and it was sitting on the the bathtub like um, faucet and I forgot about it and I took a shower and then I noticed it while I was in the shower and I saved it, it was completely soaked all the way through but it just retained shape, like it did not get damaged it did not run the colors. It looks totally normal. These things are resilient as shit. So that's a crayon bucket. Um, another My Little Pony coloring book, because you can't have enough of those. This one had a bunch of stickers. It had a, a sticker sheet. A couple, the only ones left on there. <laughs> this is fucking hilarious. The only ones left are the spike stickers, because no one fucking cares. But uh, all the other ones are around my room. I think I showed them in one of the other videos. This is something I've had since I was a, a, a tiny baby. It's a cup that has my name imprinted on it. I have no idea where it's from, what its story is. I've had it since I was like one. So it's always just been with my collection kind of thing. This fucking game of Connect 4 is easily like... We're going to say this thing is over 15 years old. And it still works. And it always remembers your place in the game. And it's fun. Sometimes I actually win against the computer. I feel good. But yeah, it's a one player. You can't you can't like two player this thing. It's just like you versus the computer at different skill levels. Uh that's a ruler. This was recent. Um when my parents were somewhere, they bought me this as a souvenir. It's just a cool little picture from um, Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. And my mom was like, yeah, you want this? And I was like, yeah, sure. But since this thing is all disorganized, I didn't really have a place to put it. This, something my mom picked up from Spencer's, I think it can best be expressed all on its own.
a low rider. Uh, this is just some modeling clay that's in here. Currently, some of it is on my window because I guess I'll show you at some point that there's this crazy ass fucking wasp nest in my window, uh, and there's the windows broken, so I used the putty to seal it. I'll show you that sometime. Here we have the most random shit. This is a collection of medals or awards. One of them says, um, Chartway Make a Wish Federal Credit Union's Annual Charity Golf Tournament, September 20th, 2001, second place team, third fl flight. This one says Volkswagen Marketplace, checkered flag Volkswagen Grand Opening, November 2001. And this one is the Volkswagen Promise. At Volkswagen, we are different, original, honest. We build cars that offer a unique combination of German engineering, safety, driving, enjoyment, and value. We are friendly and approachable. There is a segment of the North American public that admires our character. We are different and proud of it. That was weird. I've never actually read that. That's fucking weird. In any case, these were in my dad's office. And I was like, what the hell are these? And he's like, well, they've been here since before I worked here, and I just never cleaned them out because I'm lazy. And I was like, can I have them so I can put them in ironic places in my room? And my dad was like, sure. For a while, I had an irony shelf somewhere in here. It was just like all... It was like a table full of shit like this. But, uh... In, as you can tell, my room is in a transitional phase of restructuring that it has been in for over a year, so some stuff is just around. Um, this is basically everything I got from BronyCon. I haven't been able to go out and buy stuff to hang these yet, so they're just sitting here waiting for me to go get stuff to hang them. I'd show them off, but you've already seen them in the BronyCon videos, and I know you have because if you're watching these videos, there's no way you didn't watch the BronyCon videos. This was the case that that mini guitar came in, I guess. Such a weird thing. Here's a little guide called Cooking with Beer that I bought at a grocery store in the checkout lane because I was like, I don't know how to cook. I can learn some recipes by reading this and they'll have beer. And this is when I was like just really getting into beer. But the thing is, to make these recipes, you have to go out and buy all the shit. And I don't know what shit is good shit or where to find the good shit or how to cook the good shit. I don't know. I never, I have not done any of them. Here's the letter that I got. Uh, no, this is from, this is from my grandma. I think, I think this is a birthday letter from my grandma. My birthday was over a month ago. I think it had $10 in it and I actually did mean to thank her and I don't think I did. So I should probably thank my grandma for sending me $10. All right, here we have a CD, a burned CD, and it's got a story behind it. This is called Songs from the End of the World, Holy Side, and it deserves some explanation. So I was writing a story called, basically it was called Dark Dreams at the End of the World, all, all, otherwise known as Tales from the End of the World. It had different working titles, and... In 2010, I wrote 50,000 words of it, and that was for National Novel Writing Month. Every November is National Novel Writing Month. Your goal is to write a novel in the span of one month. It's 50,000 words as a novel, and um, so that's not easy to do. But the idea is that you write it as fast as possible. You don't worry about editing. You do all the editing after the month is over. You just basically write as fast as you can to say you did a novel. So, we have, from the office, office of Letters and Light, is proud to certify Conrad Collins, author of Tales from the End of the World, Book One, Scarlet C City, as the winner of National Novel Writing Month. Anyone who finishes is a winner. Uh, yeah, let's read it. Novelist, you've completed an epic journey unlike any other. During the 30 days of November, you encountered innumerable triumphs and as many obstacles, and most of your fellow writers turned back before victory was in hand, but not you. You persevered through the treacherous ice falls of writer's block to reach the warm valley of worldly inspiration. 
You silenced the voices of doubt, harnessed the winds of encouragement, and fought your way forward in the name of your novel. And now you've made it to 50,000 words, the winner's circle, and the pinnacle of creative accomplishment. We salute you and proudly add your name to the list of writers who have ventured into the unexplored depths of their imaginations and emerged one month and 50,000 words later, bearing the much-deserved title of novelist. This is the only year I've ever won NaNoWriMo. I did it by, um, in the first week or so of the, of the thing, I wrote like 20,000 words, right? And at the same time, because I was excited about the story I was writing, I was also compiling, um, like, mixtapes, basically, about the story. So I had, like, four albums. Two of them were about, were supposed to be city music. So there was the light side and the dark side, where it's like, basically, daytime, it was daytime and nighttime. So it was like daytime city music, nighttime city music. And then I had two albums of songs, or I guess it was Holy and Dark were the name of the, the city albums, because this is Holy Side. So this is Songs from the End of the World, or Songs for the End of the World, Holy Side. And then there's the character albums, where each character had their own song, and I separated that into two albums called Movers and Shakers, where the movers were the calm songs, the shakers were the heavier songs. And I burned those albums to CDs and would listen to them uh, in the car with my mom and stuff when we were driving to and from school. So it's basically just like a collection of really cool songs that had tangentially to do with my story. Wrote the first 20,000 words in the first week and a half, I think, and then I had 25k to write at the very end of the month. And on the last day, I sat down and wrote 25,000 words. The way I did it was I had to, I had to write 1,000 words per, per hour every hour of the day. And I was only allowed to sleep and eat if I was done before the end of an hour. So, like, let's say it was 2 o'clock. And I wrote 1,000 words by 2.30. That means that the rest of that half hour, I was allowed to do whatever I want. So I could take a nap or eat something. And I did that for 24 hours, got out the entire second half of this novel, and then submitted it, or, like, you know, confirmed that I was done. And then I never touched it again, because it was a mess. The, the way it was written had a whole lot of different storylines that were all intersecting. It had this big, complex, like, time fuckery storyline, and it was full of plot holes, and I knew that. And I knew I would have to edit all those plot holes, but I just gave up because it was just like, it was too difficult and I didn't really know what I was doing. And I just like lost all hope and gave up on that story. I hope to do NaNoWriMo again this year, but I need a good storyline concept before I do. Here we have a Mewtwo mouse pad. I am almost certain my girlfriend is going to steal this from me. In fact, I should just bring it with me when I come to see her so that she can have it because I'm not using it, obviously. And she is a diehard Mewtwo fangirl. She probably just, like, while watching this video, just freaked out at the sight of this. You can have it. Um, why the hell is this here? James Madison University. Uh, no comment? I have no fucking idea why this advertisement book is here. Pens... Uh, a pair of headphones, apparently. I don't know why. One of these. We're going to get to these when I get to my desk. The chain from my wallet. I was actually kind of wondering where that was. Not that I want it, because it's heavy. I'm saving this thing for last, because it, it requires a lot of explanation. Uh, here we have some pretty cool stuff that my uh, aunt gave me. I think she found this at some kind of... Um, I'm not sure where exactly. These are these little Japanese god totem thingies. I believe these are meant to bring me good luck. There's a whole long explanation of them, of course, inside this thing, where it explains who each of the gods are. The seven, seven gods of good fortune of Japanese myth. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but yeah, that's what they are. And this is a letter 
from my friend Marcus when he was in the or he's still in the army but this was from like when I think it was when he was at a basic training or, or at boot camp or whatever and we had like he couldn't use the internet or anything so we had to write letters back and forth it's a uh, let's see this would be late last year late 2012 let's read it Dear Conrad, your broke ass finally got a job. Congrats. I'm really excited to see all of the stuff you bought with your hard-earned cash. Hopefully you're not like me and you don't spend all of it on food. Not gonna lie, I regret none of it. I can't wait to start AIT. Apparently I have a lust for mechanics. I'll tell you how I came to that conclusion when I see you. I'm team leader here at Benning. I will be the one to lead the team through the breach and clear test in a f four weeks. But for right now, my job is to tell people to be quiet and talking them out of their ruts. Living with 56 guys is something I hope I never have to do again. I really miss everyone and having lots of fun at the same time. I feel like I can watch GI unironically now. Or maybe he said ironically now. I have other letters to write and no time to write them, so we'll talk later. Face to face. Face to face. Soon. Face to face. Your friend, Marcus. Um, here we have this thing that I never put together. This is pretty bad. Um, my aunt sent me this, I believe, to as a picture frame to put in my grad photo. So, oh my god, everything over here got dusty as shit. So that's me um, right after graduating high school. I was an ugly motherfucker at that time. About 20 pounds heavier, pretty bad facial hair, whatever. Anyway, very proud moment though. I was really like, even though I hated high school and I didn't really do well in high school or anything, I didn't really have much to be proud of, but just the fact that I graduated, I felt pretty good about it. Cause I had originally, I really wanted to drop out like when I was, what? Oh, that's why it's, it's not in here because it doesn't fucking fit. It doesn't quite fit. And this, these prongs are stupid. See, there was a good reason that was not together, because it doesn't really work. Whatever. Anyway, yeah, that's my grad photo. I was proud I graduated. I didn't want to graduate, but I did, and then I felt good about it. This appears to be... I was checking out a culinary institute nearby at one point before I got my job. Uh, I did not go, because it just... I don't know. Here's some random background from MLP. Don't remember where that's from. Now we're getting into some more interesting stuff that requires more explanation. Uh, this is, bo in fact, all of this comes from my college class on fundamentals of art and design. So the first thing we had to do is we were supposed to take like a poster board and just put all the stuff that represented us, um, our identity, onto one poster board. I decided to use a pizza box because I thought it would be cool, and this is my thing. It's supposed to be sort of a uh, semi-multimedia or whatever, just like random shit on a fucking pizza box. So I'm probably going to have to explain everything on here. First of all, we have these big ass pictures. Now, on my blog, every year, my anime blog, every year I have a picture that like best represents my year. Um, like some picture that I would use a lot and just resonated with me a lot. I've got some posts about this on my blog, so I'm not going to go too in-depth about it. This is a picture I had in 2008, I think. This one was from 2009. Uh, this was my website banner for at the time that I made this, when my site was called Fuzakenna, the anime blog that will always be by your side, because that was a line from this show, Kanan, um, which was in my header. We have some random picture I drew of like a girl standing against a bleeding cross, just because it's like that's what my art was usually like. It looks like I was probably 13 when I drew that, though, so I don't know why it's on here. I probably just thought it would look cool. Um, there's a dollar glued on here. It originally had a coin sticking through it. Uh, I don't really think it's meant to symbolize anything other than that money is kind of cool. Um, I have a Mountain Dew bottle top with the label from that bottle in it because I drink a lot of Mountain Dew. Scarlet Monochrome, that's a name you guys might actually recognize. That's my Tumblr. It's been around since when I made this, which, I mean, since before I made this, which I believe was in, God, this would have been late 2009, so, yeah, 
Maybe, because I was using the word Scarlet Monochrome before I made the blog, but I don't think, uh, I think it was out. Just some random, like, blood splattering with the word Chiller, because it looks cool. We have, there's a cup sticking out of this that says F, uh, it's like the letters E and F inside each other, which is based on this a show called F. Um, it says Euphoric Field. That was the old name of my anime blog before I changed it to Fuzakenna. Around this cup it says... Oh, Not Unlike the Waves, which was the name of my music blog and also one of my favorite songs by the band Agalach. Uh, there's also a Taco Bell wrapper peeking out from this thing. Um, I was eating a lot of Taco Bell back then because we live right next to a Taco Bell. The thing in the middle says 21st Century Digital Boy which was my internet handle. As you may know now, it's Digibro, which is shortened from Digital Boy. Um, and then there's a picture of the, the Pulp Fiction on here. I think I printed that just to glue on here. Uh, as for all the writing on the box, some of it is completely unreadable because I would like, like over here, I took three markers and I wrote with all three of them at once over each other, so that's unreadable. Um, there's a giant, everything is based around a giant spiral that's going around the middle, and the spiral says, it has the lyrics to, um, Lateralis by Tool on it, which goes like, spiral out, keep going, and that's, like, the lyrics that song are written about, around it, um, the line, th there's a line that says, the years you spend chasing after your dreams make up a part of your dreams, you get to burning, which is the opening theme from uh, Martian Successor Nadesco. Pierce the Heavens with Your Drill is written on here, which of course is from uh, fucking <laughs> Tengen Topic Girl and the Gone. The words I Can Fly are from Eureka 7 in this particular instance. We've got the lyrics to No One Lives Forever by Oingo Boingo. There's a Barnes and Noble thing on here. The bottom line is that this thing is an absolute clusterfuck, but that's what that's my purse. That's me. That's my identity circa 2009 or 2010. I think it was 2010. Like I it may have been early 2010 because I'm pretty sure my Tumblr and my blog were called that at the time. This is also from that class. It's a portfolio book. We had to basically take every project we did in that class, make a portfolio out of it. I called mine Tear You Up Art, which is, you know, a clever pun on Tear You Up Art, which is the name of a song by... What are they called? It's like, I want to hold you close, skin pressed against me tight. I don't remember who does it. Um, anyway, The Fundamentals by Conrad Collins. So, Tear You Up Art. Um, oh my god, there's a whole fucking artist statement. And a really cheesy picture of me down there. Let's see what it says. My name is Conrad Collins, better known by my pseudonym, 21st Century Digital Boy. I wouldn't call myself an artist. I wouldn't call myself anything, actually, as far as professional titles go, because I have yet to make any money off of anything I've done. I'm an extremely avid blogger who has and will always remain just on the verge of popularity that I will never reach by my blog's very nature. I spend most of my time on the internet and watching cartoons or reading comics. You could say that I haven't made it anywhere in my life. I am attending college now, not for any particular reason other than to buy time until I actually figure out where I am going. I'm in the multimedia curriculum, which is another phrase for the indecisive curriculum. This is amazing. <laughs> But even if I can't call myself an artist, it doesn't mean I don't create art. I write all the time, and occasionally I dip my hands into any number of artistic interests, and boy do I ever have inspiration. I've got ideas coming out of everywhere, but no definitive work that I've channeled them through. I am always sure that one day these things will come out, but I also am fully aware that nothing comes without effort. So what are my inspirations? I am infatuated with humanity, more specifically the human mind. I want to see what lies at the core of human thought. I want to see the seedy underbelly of all cognants and know what it means for people to be what they are. I want to understand madness and naturality, the spheres of the mind that control all of our actions whether we like it or not, the facts inherent in our nature that many of us will fight with all of our might to deny the existence of. I want those pure. I want to see those pure, enduring elements that humanity knows as the dark side in spite of its defining their nature. 
I have a theory that the world is a very simple is very simply black and white. White is the base core of our being, the primal desire for life that drive every single bit of human thought. Bra black is the product of white. It's when the pure instincts hit the prism of existence and refract into a rainbow of emotions and thoughts, and the amalgamation of all these creations is known as black. My aim is to look at the white and black, and then separate from the pack the color red. Red is the color of blood. It is the emotions of violence and rage and anger. Red is the most powerful emotion there is, the most impactful, brutal, and the one of the most pure of the colors. I want to look at red's place in the spectrum of black and white and define it. This is what I call my style of art. This is why I call my style of art Scarlet Monochromia, the black and white of red. In this book, I was given a great variety of assignments, and I will admit that I did not incorporate my style into all of them. In many cases, it is the presentation that most defines my style in the work. You will see some of some interpretations that may be harder to understand, such as the prolific use of the word fuzakenna, a Japanese word brimming with red emotions, and the name of my website. So I hope that you will look for things like that in the works that you see here. And then there's like just a regular uh, profile down there. That was pretty interesting. Explains why my blog's called Scarlet Monochrome, if you didn't know, which I don't think I've really explained other than here before. Table of contents. So we've just got like elements of design and it's like texture line color whatever we took pictures of stuff uh, different kinds of lines one day this chalk oh god I've got song quotes on these as well yeah this okay so elements of design it says an element in an alcove which is a reference to a god in an alcove by Bauhaus this one says one day this chalk outline will circle this city which is a reference to this apparatus must be unearthed by the Mars Volta. First property of color mixing, hue. Back then, black then white are all I see in my infancy. Red and yellow then came to be. That's a reference to Lateralis by Tool. Value charts. You and I, we can light up the night. That's a reference to light up the night by Protoman. Value key. Step forward, step into the light. Uh, same song. Well, not same song, but same band. Texture part one, dark dreams at the end of the world. This is where we start getting into the stuff that's more me artistically. Um, just some weird texture pictures. One of them says like kill and justice, which is a reference to uh, the dot hack manga. One of them just says end of the world. And then there's beads, which are arranged in the Fibonacci sequence. But I think some of them have fallen off. Which, again, is in reference to Lateralis by Tool, which is a song that's built around the Fibonacci sequence. Everything with me is referential to something. Um, some more interesting texture art. I like that one on top, actually, quite a bit. I can't really read it, but it says... Uh, the insanity and ecstasy of madness awaits. Sounds fun. That's a line from Soul Eater. And then this one with the hand says metronome arthritis by at the drive-in. What if forensics find the answer? What if they stole my fingerprints? Where do I leave? Where did I leave my book of matches? We'll find you. All lines from that song, metronome arthritis. And that says the insanity and ecstasy of madness on it. Yeah, I'm supposed to be holding it like this. This is really difficult to do with a stationary camera. Oh man. More cool texture stuff. I like this one with the, like, Gears of War cog, basically, um, and a bunch of blood splattery things. I might be a little obsessed with blood. This one's called A Scream to Express the Hate of a Race, which is a song by Mirror Throne. The words, um, yeah, that's, the lyrics seem to be from that song. So, yeah, cool stuff. Shape and Pattern. This is absolutely me being lazy. See, the thing about these is that while some of them are a little cool, like, throughout the book, all of this is lazy art. Like, all of it is thrown together, last minute, D grade. I got a D in this class. Um, spiral out, keep going. Uh, this one says intensity. I just drew... I believe it's supposed to look like Claire Stanfield from Baccano when he becomes Vino by covering himself in blood. Uh, I like my coffee black just like my metal is a quote from Mindless Self-Indulgence song Shut Me Up. Some color stuff. 
my eyes are blind, but I can see from Snowblind by Black Sabbath. Bezeled effect. One of these shapes is not like the others. Oh. This one is just a fucking clusterfuck. I don't know. It's for scale, I guess. And it's just like a bunch of glued together magazine photos. Uh, proportion. Same, same difference. Just like make some shit look big or small by putting it next to other shit. Oh, spatial cue. This is just ugly. Asymmetry, I guess. Uh, more lazy ass shit. And then there was silence. I don't know. Yeah, most of that was awful. Um, I think the texture stuff was pretty cool, but most of it was just like lazy, phoned in, shitty art. So, we cleared off the top rack, which now just looks like gross, dusty mess. I should probably clean it before I put all that stuff back. Uh, here's a sketch pad. This is semi-recent. Um, this is not my art right here. This is drawn by a chick I know who is much better at art than me. That looks like it's Victor trying to draw a girl. That's my art. That looks more like me kind of style. Oh, what is this? Some kind of schedule I was trying to write. This Brandon Burke, who also known as MC um, MC Brandoff, I think. You may have seen some of my videos and stuff. This is my art. The Predatory Wasp of the Palisades, which is named after a Sufjan Stevens song. Everything with me is named after a song. Here we go. Here's my snowdrop art. She's saying... I can't see why I love Cinnamon Toast Crunch, but I can taste why. Then you have Digibrony. Oh, like one of the only artworks of Digibrony I've done saying, what the fuck is my life? So. This was, I attempted to do a draw my life once, and this is why I can't do a draw my life. Alright, moving along. Here is a Japanese Megami magazine. These magazines are basically just smut. Most of it is meant to talk about upcoming games, shows, whatever, and have lots of really saucy artwork. The reason you buy these, though, is because they come with a shitload of posters. I think I talked about this in one of my other videos, that I have a lot of shitty posters that I don't have up on my walls anymore because I don't really like them. The only reason I had them is because I wanted to have an otaku room covered completely in posters. We're going to start seeing those posters before long, but i got to wait through some other stuff. In fact, they should be coming right up. Let's just pull this whole fucking stack out. Oh, my lord. Oh, there's all kinds of fun stuff in here. So, first thing we're probably going to have to really address is this bed sheet of Chihiro from F A Tale of Memories. This I got at some year Otakon. It is an extremely saucy bed sheet. For a while I actually had this hanging from my ceiling and now you know why there's an age gate on this video <laughs> because this is my saucy ass bed sheet. Obviously folded it up, put it away, don't really care can't get to this yet. Some random ass like advertisement handed out at a con. Now we're going to start getting into posters. This is not a poster, it's just trash. Um, you see, I have a bunch of... Some of these posters are from those Megami magazines. Those are like official posters. Then I have a bunch of old anime magazines that I just like pulled out pages that looked cool and I put those on my walls because I was desperate for posters. So there's going to be a mixture of all that. This actually is not a Megami poster. These ones are from Dengeki Hime. This was just a case of my friend had a bunch of anime posters he didn't want anymore, and he gave them to me, right? So, like, half of them, they're all two-sided. They'll either have, like, some cute picture and then some naughty picture that would never have been on my wall because I live with other people. And, uh, and then, like... 
these are all from games that I have no idea what the games are. I don't care. I wanted posters, so that's why they're up on my walls. I can't even remember what this show is. This is from Kyoran Kazuku Nikki. Now we're getting into the Megami posters. I'm gonna. The game here is: Can I name the shows that these are from? So I can name Kyoran Kazuku Nikki. That was a good show. Um, this is another Dengeki Hime poster. So I have no idea what it is. Here we have. All right, I know this. Fuck, they're all stuck together with the fucking poster goop. This is Saki. That was an excellent show. This is Toradora. That's also a great show. So, that's an okay one. But again, the posters are like, they're all either perverse or terrible. So, like, I think this is Idolmaster Xenoglossia. Never actually seen it. This is a pretty cute poster from uh, Higurashi. So that's actually pretty okay. I actually have the art book that has this picture in it um, in one of the other videos. Not a Fate... No, this is Fate's daughter. What's her name? It's from Nanoha. On the other side we have F, A Tale of Memories. Very large poster, again from my friend, of Mai from My Hime. Ah, come unstuck, you bastard. Oh, saucy. Yeah, so that we got that one going on. I am making a huge mess off camera, by the way, with these posters. They're just, I'm just like haphazardly throwing them in a pile. What is this? Is it, um, Kodo... Kodomo no Jikan. That's an incredibly perverse lolly series. Uh... Oh, that's some, um, Shugo Chara. And I know I had this side up because this side is a little bit much. It's from Kurenai, which is one of my favorite shows, but the poster itself is just like, really? Is that girl's like seven. That's just like messed up. I not want perverse pictures of seven-year-olds on my wall, even if they're anime characters. This is actually a cool poster. This is not from a magazine. This came with a DVD for Les Portraits des Petites Cosettes, which is a phenomenal show directed by Akiyuki Shinbo, who's my favorite anime director. That should probably just stay out because it's actually cool. This is another one that came with a DVD for Haruhi Suzumiya. Uh, actually came with one of the CDs. I should really keep all the ones like this out because they're actually worth having. Uh, when They Cry, a.k.a. Higurashi, insert from a DVD. This appears to be from Clannad. And uh, so, my girlfriend loves Clannad. I don't know if she likes Tomio, so maybe she, I'll give that her that. The other side, though, is a really great k poster that I'm surprised I even took down because it's actually really cool. And I love k -On. Maybe I'll actually hang some of these back up. Who knows? Oh, and here's another, well, this is from, uh, oh, wow, this is, like, tape. Okay, I'm tearing it. So, <laughs> this is from King of Bandits Jing DVD insert poster. Uh, apparently it has legit tape on it, so it's not really safe to open back up. Here is a sweet FLCL poster. This came from an old Anime Insider magazine. That's actually really nice. Put that in the keep pile. Making a keep pile. Here's a, oh, this is pretty cool, except for the fact that it's from the shittiest Godzilla movie. That's probably the only reason I took it down. Got some super old posters from the American Godzilla movie. Look, this movie's bad. I know it's bad. You know it's bad. But nine-year-old Digibro thought this was, not even nine. What was I, fucking eight, six, seven? Whenever I saw this movie, it was phenomenal. It pissed me off so much that this movie was critically panned and did poorly at the box office, so it never got a sequel, and it pissed me off because I thought this was amazing. Now I'm older, and I know it's bad. Oh, here's some really uh, raunchy posters going on here, but I don't think I... Again, I've never hung up the ones that are like really raunchy. It's just a blank piece of paper. Okay. Um, some kind of booklet from Nanoha. This is another thing that my friend got. The thing is, 
my friend who gave me all these posters, he hated Nanoha because it was super popular and he didn't get why. He didn't get into the show at all. He gave all the Nanoha shit to me. At the time, I didn't like Nanoha either. I was like, whatever. But then I did get into it later, so now I'm kind of glad I have all that stuff. This is actually my favorite of the Naughty posters. It's actually a really good poster, but again, I'm not going to put that up in my room when there's people who live in my house. More dirty. Oh my god. Hot lesbian makeouts. So that's cool. Hopefully this video doesn't get like flagged for deletion or something or flagged as inappropriate and I get some striking as my account. It's age gated. I know this video is age gated. You better not be watching this if you're under 18 and getting me in trouble. That's a pretty cute one. But whatever. Naughty posters, naughty posters. Oh, this is neat. Here we have a... This is probably, like, despite the fact that it's in a shit condition, this could actually be worth something. It's a Gorilla's Demon Days, um, uh, trick-or-treat bag. Where the hell is this from? It just says gorillas.com on it. So that's pretty cool. That's probably a rare item. Um, some random vertical magazine ad thing for vertical. <coughs> I'm gonna get to the magazines in a bit, so I don't want to look at those yet. Uh, ones that had posters, blah blah, shitty, shitty, shitty shit. Some of this is just random pages of magazines that have fallen apart. They're not even posters. Oh, cool. Oot Noah's on the cover of Animerica. Here's a Loveless uh, full page for you, for the ladies out there. Another Animerica. Oh my god, this is such a clusterfuck. This is a really cute poster. It's not even naughty at all. Oh fuck, come on. Ah, some adorable little, like, bully cat girls or something? I don't know. Really bad Haruhi posters. Shit, I don't even know. I have no idea where any of this shit came from. Oh. Here we have some Hitamari Sketch, which is a show I adore. Uh, these are all stuck together. I'm not even going to bother pulling these apart. Oh, here's another cool Petite Cosette one, just ripped out of a magazine. <laughs> this one I love because it was about, um, it was from an article about censored episodes of shows, or like stuff that was censored when they brought it to the US, and you can't really tell because of the lighting, but... It's card capture Sakura with a giant like denied lock on it. I thought that was fucking hilarious to have on my wall. In fact, I still like that, so I'm gonna keep that. Um, and I love card capture Sakura, so that just makes it even better. Uh, excruciating number of. Oh man. Old ass G fan magazine. Covers missing, but this is a Godzilla fanzine that is just all about Godzilla. I've, I'm sure you have never read this. In fact, this is probably the first time I've ever even really looked through it. Oh my god, it's got stuff about the. some of the shit Movie Bob talks about. Okay, this is officially epic as shit, so I'm probably going to read this. As soon as I turn the camera off. And then I'm also going to show it to my cousin Boyd. Because he'll love it. I'll probably just give it to him. Battlestar Galactica. Old school ad on the back. That's cool shit. Cooler than all these. Oh my. What the fuck? I remember this poster. This is a weird Gurren Lagann poster. Look at Yoko's tits. That is ridiculous. That is unnecessary. Uh, more posters that aren't really interesting. Magazine pages galore. Why do I save all this shit? Here we have some pencil boards from Read or Die. It came with all these random pencil boards. You want to see some pretty boy uh, shirtless? There you go. See, I'm playing to both crowds here. I don't just have perverse guy stuff. I have perverse girl stuff. Um... More nano, 
Nanoha and Fate, and then Kaon on the back. I would not be able to decide here. Like, these are two great, like, groups of people, characters. Here's some cool, more like, like, this is, it's like, on the one hand, you've got a cool, detailed picture. On the other hand, you have Konata and Kagami shipping. I know I explained in one of the other Otaku Room videos or whatever that I was a huge fan of this ship for a while. So, like, this was, like, my favorite poster ever when I got it. Some of these are posters I would put back up. I just kind of forgot that I had them. Because um, I, I didn't take the posters down exclusively, like, to never put them back up again. It was just a matter of, um, I wanted to have, like, a more concerted effort of doing so. More Nano Fate pencil boards. Here's a giant ass poster of fucking Shakugan no Shana, which is the worst thing ever, so I'm not even gonna do it the dignity of showing it on camera. Now we're getting into more of the DVD insert stuff. We have a reverse cover for Mushishi, um, a poster that came with Haibani Renmei. Not a really cool poster, but it's Haibani Renmei. It's a great show. If you haven't seen that show, you probably need to. Oh, is that. I think it's from Whisper of the Heart. It could easily be mistaken for Kiki's Delivery Service, but that's just because it's Ghibli. Oh, a whole bunch more of these posters that come with shows or reverse covers. Some from Dokoida, which is a uh, tokusatsu parody anime. Kamichu, which is a super adorable show that everyone needs to see. I've got a bunch of those. Um, more, more... Kamichu Gunslinger Girl. That's pretty cool. All these are worth saving. Gunslinger Girl, I guess all the reverse covers for that. I love that these are flat now because they didn't used to be. More Haibani Renmei. Ooh, this is more like what it should look like. That's the, the true form of its art. I think I showed art books of that guy's work in one of these videos. Some more Reader Die shit. Some fucking. This needs to go back up. Even though it's tiny. Oh my god, I ripped it. Ugh, why did I use this fucking putty shit? Ugh! End of Evangelion. Fucking absolute classic. Ugh, more Mushishi posters, more Read of Die posters. They're all stuck together. I'm just throwing them up here. Some more mag. Oh, these magazines always fall apart, like, at the touch. More Reader Die, and I finally finished all the damn posters. So, now we get to talk about magazines. I think I described in one of the um, Q&A videos that I have a long history with magazines. I grew up with them, I loved them, I admired them, I wanted to write them. And I did, when I was 11, write a magazine. That's how I spent my summer as a kid. So, some of my earliest magazines were these Anime Insiders. Originally, it was called Anime Invasion, and I think I have some Anime Invasion in here. But they, once the invasion was over, they started going by Anime Insider. So, I've got a bunch of these that, some of them are ones that I bought as a kid. And then later, I got a lot of these from Free Comic Book Days. Because they, there's a store called Comic Trilogy that's near my house. It's a super awesome comic book store. And they have like a huge backlog of Anime Insider and America and all kinds of other magazines. And so they'll just give them away on free comic book day. So I've got like a, a bunch of them because I was like, I'll just grab them. And again, I was going to tear out pages that had advertisements like full page ads and put them on my walls. So I snatched up all the old Anime Insiders and because nostalgia and it's just fun to have them. So all these, but they've, they're fucking so cheaply made that they just fall apart literally by touching them. Um, that's why there's a bunch of covers just like laying around, not attached to any particular com uh, magazine. And then the ones where there's no cover and you're like, I don't even know what magazine this is. But of course, you know, it's Anime Insider. It's like one... F this is such a bad article. 101 facts you must know to be an otaku. And it's like, I remember reading that shit and being like, literally, like, this makes you an entry-level fan knowing this shit. But whatever. I'm just a pretentious asshole. Um, 
more recent one, Otaku USA. This is the only anime magazine that is still running, I think, or at least findable. No, there's another one, but it's not as good. This is actually interesting because a lot of the guys who write in this magazine are anime bloggers, like the big name anime bloggers. Um, like, I believe Mike Tool writes in this, and what's that other dude's name? Fucking guy who runs a podcast. People, the people who run all the fucking panels at your local anime convention, they're the ones who write Otaku USA. And as far as anime magazines go, it's okay. I mean, anime magazines are not really good, to be completely honest. What I've learned as an adult is that they're just shit. But all magazines are shit, basically, because magazines are not really concerned about being, like, analytical or anything. They're mostly just, like, a bunch of shitty articles. But these ones are have a... Otaku USA... Because Anime Insider, you read this and you get the feeling that they're just talking about whatever they got paid to talk about. Like, it's not really fan content so much as it is advertisements, essentially. Whereas this really feels like people wrote this because they care about shit and not just because they were paid to write about it. So, by the companies that are whatever. Here's one of the new type USAs I have. This is the worst anime magazine that ever existed. Even though it was the most expensive, it was the most premium. It's got the biggest, most beautiful pages. Except the layout is shit. It has nothing to say about anything. I have a bunch of these because my friend Marcus, aforementioned, gave me them. He used to collect them back in like 2006. He gave me his whole backlog because I asked for them, and they are awful. Then we have Animerica. This magazine was around when I first got into anime, but it, it dissolved in like 2004, I think. So I only have like three issues of this from way the hell back. Um, this is the one I remember best because it's got S. Cryed and it's got an interview with the director that I transcribed onto the internet because I thought it was interesting. Um, what else do we have here? Here's an EGM magazine. I remember this from way back when I was into video games. It apparently has some kind of, like, passcodes written on it. Um, game magazines, whatever. Who cares? Oh, what is this? Another Animerica with Big O. More of these. I get these ones are not ones that I had back in 2003. These are ones that I got from uh, from free comic book days. More anime insiders that are all destroyed. Robotech or Macross even the history of Macross on a uh, on one of those. Here we go. Here's some cool shit. Pokemon, a comic, but it's not the Pokemon comic. It's the TV animation comic. They literally took screen caps from the show, put the text from the show on those screen caps, and then released that in book form. Why? I have no idea. Maybe your parents couldn't afford a VCR to get a VHS with these episodes on it. I think they only did like one or two of these. I have the first one. It's literally the first six episodes, probably with parts cut out, because that's a lot to fit in one volume. And it's just the screen caps with the text on it. So that's pretty pretty abysmal, but it's Pokemon merch. And as you will learn if I ever actually go through my closet, I mean my attic, I have a fuckload of Pokemon merch. More anime insiders. This one looks like it's all got wet at some point. And okay, so I guess we're done with those. This episode is going to run really long. I'm realizing. <sighs> but the kind of people who are begging me to do more of these probably don't mind. Here is, I guess... Oh my god, this is a typeface ruler. Did I steal this? This you will not possibly understand unless you have taken a typography class or a graphic design class. But this is a typeface ruler. That's probably worth having around. Meanwhile... This, if you can't tell by the giant, likely expensive, like, car decal stickers on it, is my Pokemon card collection. And I think I'm holding it upside down. Pokemon cards. Alright. So, they are currently in order of, I'm guessing, alphabetical? 
but you'll notice that there's little stickers. The stickers are in the order that the Pokemon would appear in, um, in numerical order in the series, like, you know, Bulbasaur, Ivysaur, Venusaur, Charmander, Charmeleon, Charizard, and so on and so forth. I know I at one point had this organized where it was in the card numbers, like, for each series. So, like, if this is number um, 2 out of 102 in the series, that's the organization. In fact, that might be how it's organized right now. Yeah, that is how it's organized. That's why it's all hollows right here. So now they're organized by card number. So we have, like, base set 1, which is the original Pokemon cards, go into, let's see... Base set two, or no, like series two, this is uh, the jungle, or whatever it was called, card set. You eventually get into, uh, these are a bunch of these fucking weird, these were like non-playing cards, they were just like, uh, they were trading cards, but they weren't playing cards. I never f had an affection for them, because you couldn't actually play with them, but I have a fuckload of them anyway. Uh, this is base set two. Now we have the, the... The Team Rocket series, which is where you had the dark uh, Pokemon, like Dark Arbok, Dark Dragonite, shit like that. Oh, uh, we have the Gym Leader series, which is where it was like, you'd have Misty's Seedra and Lieutenant Surge's Magneton. Basically, all this shit would just make the rules even more complicated. And this was like the hardest series to actually play, because you couldn't evolve a Venonat into a... Venomoth, it had, like, you couldn't evolve Sabrina's Venonat into a regular Venonoth. It had to be Sabrina's Venonoth. That, ah, I cannot pronounce that. There was another trainer series, so I've got all the ones from that shit. Then we move into, what the fuck is this? Okay, this is where it was Neo Pokemon. So, the, all that was just from, like, the first fucking 150 Pokemon. They made that many cards out of it. Then you got into Neo Pokemon, which was when they made uh, Gold and Silver. Uh, set two of that. Some Japanese cards are in here. Set three of Neo Pokemon. And then I think I basically stopped collecting Pokemon cards after Gold and Silver. Which you have to understand was a pretty long period of my childhood. Those Pokemon games don't come out like one after another. You know, like I would say we stopped collecting probably in 2001 or probably from 1997 to 2001. And Ruby and Sapphire didn't come out till 2003. So this was a significant amount of my childhood of Pokemon cards. With a lot of different series, they kept coming out with, you know, like each year there'd be a new set of Pokemon cards. Even though there was not a new set of Pokemon. Because they were constantly making new rules, new adjustments to the series. I'm not going to go through this entire book. That could be its own video. None of my doubles are in here. There's a whole box for just doubles. So this is all single cart from each different series the doubles box is bigger than I can show with my hands so that's my collection moving along this is some kind of it's another Megami magazine this one has K-On on the cover that's probably why I bought it uh, cuz I lo fucking love K-On here we have Beckett's Pokemon collector this was another huge deal magazine of my youth. Beckett Pokemon Collector was just these really tiny magazines that talk about Pokemon. Every single one would have a list of every fucking card in it. Not always by picture, but like this is probably a new series came out. So like almost the entire magazine is just showing you Pokemon cards. It would have information about cards, it would have strategies. It would have price guides. That's the most important thing about these. They had epic size fucking price guides to how much your cards are worth. So that if you were trading, like, you know, we would go to Pokemon League, which is where you fight other people, like, you, you play against other people and trade cards. My mom would always make sure that we weren't trading our cards for anything that was worth less than ours. So, like, if I had an Alakazam and it's worth like two dollars and someone else has a fucking Charizard that's worth like a hundred dollars you know my mom would sit there and be like whoa hold up you know are you sure you want to make these trades there's like there's an art gallery for Dragon Ball Z in here magazines from the 90s are fucking weird uh, especially these low-end ones there's like a whole win a Gundam wing model kit here in the back 
So, yeah. I have no idea. Here's some Digimon ads. I have a fuckload of these. I'm pretty sure they suck and have no real merit. Oh, here's some cool shit. Here's some of my, like, like weird rare card collections. So, like, here's a collection of Japanese cards where it's got, like, some unknowns. A Japanese Espeon, Eevee, and Umbreon. Pichu, Charizard, and, uh, and Entei. It's just, like, a collection of nine random-ass rare cards. I've got a few of these, like, collection books that I got for my birthday at some point. Um, this one is all Pikachus. Pikachu World Collection. Uh, apparently there's a pencil board in here. Pikachu World Collection. So you've got the birthday Pikachu where you're supposed to write in the person's name. And it's like, it's their Pikachu. Uh, Fleagendis Pikachu. Some other ones. Like, one's Chinese... One's in Spanish. It's just like a variety of worldly Pikachus. So that's pretty interesting. We have a Neo collection. This is just like the base set of... Um, what the hell the fuck do you... Base set of monsters from Neo, but uh, from Japanese. I have no idea where my mom got these. Like, this appears to be the exact same thing. Just a double of it. Uh, here we have a bunch of Neo Pokemon. It's mostly legendaries in Japanese. Uh, I think that's the end of those. So those are interesting. I have no idea what they are, though. This appears to be some really short manga that I have no way of explaining in Japanese. No idea what that is. Here's a Right Stuff anime catalog. Right Stuff is one of the biggest online uh, stores for anime shit and if you buy shit from them they will send you quarterly catalogs for like a year just literally listing like everything that you could find on the site but in text form I used to just read these like it's all just a script like you know oh castle in the sky and then there's like a little synopsis of the movie and I just sit here in class because I was fucking bored and I'd read these, and I'd actually, this one doesn't have any check marks. I would go through with a pen and, like, circle all the stuff I was interested in. Sometimes it was a buying guide, sometimes as a watching guide of stuff that just seemed cool from Right Stuff magazine. I wonder if any of these has that. This one, okay, yeah, here we go. I've taken a, a, um, a silver sharpie to the pages and written in, like, notes and shit. Some of them is just like me writing Raffle on a bad show. That's fucking hilarious. Otakon 2008 guidebook. This thing is thick as fuck. Why is it so thick? Let's see who was at Otakon 2008. Except I already know. It had Jam Project that year. Oh, whatever. Another Right Stuff catalog. Here we have the weirdest fucking magazine I have. This is Cube. Cube magazine. It's a GameCube-centric magazine. I'm pretty sure it's from Europe. And it's Cube Collector's Edition with Metroid Prime on the cover. Now, I was a huge Nintendo fanboy growing up, as you will soon learn from my Nintendo Power collection. I saw this in a store one time. I think it was, like, my birthday, even. It was $10, which to me was, like, really expensive for a magazine. And it's all GameCube-centric, so I was like, this is fucking perfect. And all I remember about this magazine is that there's a whole article in here about characters that were going to be in, like, Soul Calibur. And it was totally incorrect. It's all like, oh yeah, Toon Link and Ganondorf are gonna be in the next Soul Calibur game and shit. And, like, all this misinformation. So... Like, I've always been confused about, like, is this magazine just, like, fake? Is it tabloid? Like, what's going on? It's just got random misinformation in it. I, I should just read it now as an adult and find out, like, what was it about. I'll keep it aside. Oh, another Beckett Pokemon collector. Or Pokemon and anime collector. That was when Pokemon was, like, starting to be on the... It was starting to go out, and so they started fusing Yu-Gi-Oh! into it. Eventually, they would make Beckett Yu-Gi-Oh! Collector. But as Yu-Gi-Oh! was starting to become popular and Pokemon was starting to fade, 
they became Beckett Pokemon and Anime Collector. More Beckett. Nintendo Powers. Here's a random Duel Master comic for free comic book day. Uh, just keep telling myself I'm just giving you guys what you asked for. Alright. Now we're going to get into this fucking enormous collection of Nintendo Power Magazine. I got a lot of these. You'll notice they're all really worn down. That's because I, I would... I had these around with me as a kid. I was obsessed with Nintendo Power Magazine. Did I read it? Not really. But did I look at it a lot? Hell yes. Did I memorize all the scores of their reviews? Kind of. This is why I am an analyst. This is why I write review-like things on the internet. Because I grew up with this shit obsessively over magazines. What I used to do is I would memorize who was on the cover of each magazine by month. This is why I grew up socially awkward. <laughs> I'd be like arguing with someone about why Nintendo is better than Sony and then I'd be like I know so much about Nintendo I can name who the c character was on the cover of each magazine for the past two years and people would be like I, what? I don't care. What are you saying? Why are these words coming out of your mouth? So yeah, Nintendo Power sadly has gone out of business as of like last year, maybe even this year. Nintendo Power finally ended. Um, it had gone to shit anyways, but whatever. So down here we have a huge collection of Game Informers. As you will know, if you have ever shopped at GameStop and bought one of their GameStop cards that you need to have, you don't need to have it, but you should, they immediately will give you a 10-month subscription to Game Informer. So I have like two or three years worth of Game Informers in here. And of course I would read those as well because I love reviews and I'd look at all the scores of their reviews and shit. So Game Informer is a terrible magazine because it's basically just like paid for by the people who they're um, you know talking about so whatever here we have a princess twilight coronation thing that I haven't put together yet basically you're supposed to create a scene with a bunch of like cutout dudes from Hot Topic haven't put it together yet though we're moving into some CD cases So this is a spe oh Kingdom Hearts 2 is in here. It can just stay there. These discs are all of the original anime that I downloaded back in like 2007. Back when anime was small enough that you could fit like 13 episodes onto one disc. This is the second half of Gurren Lagann and the show Black Heaven. That's actually more than 13 episodes. That's like a significant number. DVD rips of Ichigo Marshmallow. This is just super, super old rips of shit. Escaflone 1 through 18. Moyashimon and Sketchbook full colors. Anime was a lot smaller. Nowadays, anime takes up half a fucking gig per episode. And these are like 4 gig discs. So, yeah. 5 centimeters per second. Tsukuyomi Moon Phase. More Gruen Lagan and Nia Under 7. If you want an idea of what I was watching back in 2009, there's also a bunch of burned CDs that are left over from uh, my cousin Boyd. He had, a, like, he had a massive, massive collection of burned CDs in his car. And so I got a lot of my music library from that. It's like every Galnerius album burned right here. So... Yeah, that's what that stuff is. Huge stacks of what looks like blank CDs. More. Huge stacks of burned DVDs. Again, it's all anime from like 2007 and 2008. Basically, whenever I needed to clear off my computer, I would just burn a bunch of stuff to DVDs. This was before external hard drives were cheap. It was before you could have like a ton of storage on a flash drive. 
Uh, Ichigo Marshmallow again. Ugh. This is a random ass Lucky Channel like 15 minute radio segment that was like some free promotional thing but it's in Japanese and let me tell you there's a good reason that Americans don't usually get into Japanese radio plays because there's a lot of them a lot of anime have radio shows you can't subtitle a radio show so it's kinda hard to understand here's a Ragnarok online installation disc some free games from or free demos from Manga Gamer, which was the first website to start porting uh, Japanese um, dating sim games into English, like officially. Uh, and they did Higurashi, which I actually own on disc, and we'll get to in a different video. Here's a CD case, probably nothing in it. Yep, nothing in it. More burned DVDs. This one says Any Song 2. So that means this that means that was one of the collections of anime songs that we burned to a CD for drives to Baltimore when we're going to Otakon. And then we're finally getting into the last stretch here. This is What is this? This is a comic magazine in Japanese, but I don't remember owning this particular one. Where did this come from? Uh, maybe oh, this might be one of the ones my aunt sent me or something. So, yeah, here's a J Japanese. Ma By the way, this is what manga is. This is how it's read in Japan. It's just these giant fucking like weekly or monthly books that have shitloads of manga in it. This one has like Fate Stay Night. It's got I don't know what this is. It's got Lucky Star, it's got Fate Stay Night, it's got some other popular shit. This is what pretty much all manga is read like in Japan, though. Giant fucking volumes. Random ass infinite revised pencil board. I don't know why. Then we have some American manga collections. This is Yen Plus, which Yen Press is one of the better American manga distributors. They very briefly had a manga collection magazine, but it didn't do very well, so they shut it down after like a year or maybe two. And then we have a huge amount of Shonen Jump magazine. So Shonen Jump US, of course, is the direct translation of Shonen Jump Japan, except Shonen Jump Japan is fucking enormous and the American ones aren't that big. And Shonen Jump Japan is weekly, whereas Shonen Jump America was monthly usually had two chapters of each popular thing so like this one's got uh, this is like late era Shonen Jump so this has Hunter Hunter, One Piece, Naruto, Hikaru no Go, Shaman King, Yu-Gi-Oh, Dragon Ball Z, Yu Yu Hakusho then you've got like all my old ones I've got from the third issue they ever did which was in 2003 up through 2005 and then 2005 they started getting thinner um, I'd haul them all out, but they're fucking enormous, and I've got a shitload of them. So there's just, like, stacks on stacks of Shonen Jump magazines in here. Um, and some random t Tidewater Community College book thing. But most of them have Yugi on the cover. Yu-Gi-Oh! was always the most popular thing in the magazine. I know you're probably thinking, really? It was more popular than Naruto and One Piece and Bleach? Yes, way more popular. Yu-Gi-Oh! was always on the fucking cover of Shonen Jump. Uh, although I guess they put in Dragon Ball Z at some point. Um, some Haibane Renmei pencil boards in here. Also some Iron-On... Haruhi Suzumi has shit that I never ironed on to anything. This one's kind of adorable. I love that the light makes it so you can actually tell what the hell these are. Uh, yeah. Then we've got all that's left. There's some more pencil boards in here. These all came with Haruhi DVDs, Read or Die DVDs. And then the last two things in here are two volumes of the Boondocks comics. You've got A Right to be Hostile, which covers, like, the first probably, like, four years or some shit. And then Public Enemy Number 2. 
I don't think the comic ran much longer than this one. So this is most of the Boondocks comic. Um, I think I got the first one in like 2005. <clears throat> oh my god, there's so much dust. I'm choking on it. <coughs> oh, Jesus. I got into the Boondocks in like 2005. Like years before they started the cartoon. The cartoon and the and the comic are, while they have the same themes, they are not similar, really. The comic is much more like, it's usually political, it's usually very current, and it has way fewer characters than the cartoon has, uh, and definitely none of the crazy adventure stories that the cartoon has. So, um, still good, so I haven't read it in years, but I'm sure it's still great. So... Here's a giant collection of sticky notes that are shaped like the letter C. And that's how we're going to end this one. We ran long, but I guess it's making up for lost time. You guys wanted this shit, so I don't think it really matters. Oh, aren't you glad we're back? Now I get to enjoy spending probably just as much time putting all this shit back. Because I made a huge mess. Thank you.